Hello, everyone. Welcome to Changard Live. Today, we're going to be talking about all about that base, those base container images, and what we need to do to secure those. So, Changard recently has released a white paper about that, and we're going to discuss that with the authors of that white paper. And we're also going to discuss a little bit more about container security in general with some Alpine esque questions about that. So with that, I'll get started. My name is James Strong. I'm the lead solutions architect here at ChainGuard, helping make supply chains secure by default. And with us, we've got Zach Newman. Zach, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hey, all. Uh, my name is Zach. I'm a software engineer here at ChainGuard. John Speed. Thanks, Seth. Thanks, James. Uh, I'm John Speed Myers. I'm a security data scientist here at ChainGuard. And last but not least, Ariadne. Can you tell us what you do here? Uh, sure. Uh, I'm Ariadne. Uh, I am a software engineer at ChainGuard. Um, I work on the container images supply chain, basically, and um, largely focused around Alpine, of course, but also some Debian as well. So that's what I do. Awesome. Well, with that, let's go ahead and just dive right into this white paper. So all about that base, those base images in containers. So we did some security scanning. Can you guys, Zach and John, can you talk a little bit about um, what you did, some of the base, uh, base images basics and what we should be doing to secure those? Sure. Thanks, James. Uh, yeah, so to start, uh, I'll just give a little bit of context. It should be familiar to many of you, uh, but, but it, it's helpful to define terms so we're all on the same page. Um, so yeah, so base images. What are base images? Well, to understand base images, you kind of have to go back and understand containers. Containers are rapidly becoming the most popular way to deploy applications. Uh, you bundle your app up in a standard format, and it kind of runs anywhere. Um, it's, it's sort of the right once run anywhere dream, um, as, as close as we've gotten uh, over, over many decades of trying. Um, and wh when that's running, you're, you call that a container. But you launch a container based on a container image. Uh, that's sort of the bundle that contains your app and its dependencies in, in that whole environment. Um, and the base image, well, that's when you're building your container image, you usually start from somewhere. You start from an existing image, and then you add your application, uh, you add dependencies. Um, and, and at the end of the day, you often, not always, have, have many of the components of an operating system. Um, and so uh, the base image is sort of your starting place, the, the base container that you build your, your container image from. Um, yeah, and so, and so that base image, that's, that's an important choice here, right? Uh, what, what that base image is, is going to have a lot of implications for the security of your application as it's running. And that's, that's kind of what we're here to talk about today. Um, so the other concept I, I'd like to introduce before we get into the, the details of, of the research and what we found uh, is security debt. So security debt is a term uh, we've coined sort of by analogy with technical debt. Uh, so technical debt, right, is something that drags on your productivity because of uh, unaddressed issues in, in an existing code base. Uh, similarly, security debt uh, drags on uh, your security posture. Uh, it's unaddressed security issues. Um, and so in the context of base images, why do we, why do we care about security debt? Well, uh, the base image might have vulnerable software in it. Uh, and in fact, that's actually pretty common and that, that's what we're gonna see later on today. Uh, and so what, what does that mean? It means there's some file somewhere in the base image that belongs to some software that has a vulnerability in it. And, and typically when we're talking about this, we care mostly about uh, vulnerabilities that have been registered in the, in the CVE database run by MITRE. So it's a semi-official uh, registry of, of all the vulnerabilities you're gonna care about. And there are a lot of vulnerability scanners that can go through container images and, and operating systems and so on and find uh, software packages that have vulnerable code in them. Um, and so, so you're, already start, you're already starting at a disadvantage with vulnerable base images. Ex exactly, yeah. And, and that's, that's a big part of the point we want to make. One caveat is very, you know, just because a vulnerability is present in a file in your container 
doesn't mean it's actually exploitable, right? And, and so CVEs are ranked on, on sort of their severity and their exploitability. Um, so you might think, you know, what's, what's the big deal of having a vulnerability if it's in something I'm not using? Um, but but our, our argument is that you're incurring some kind of security debt. You're incurring a cost, basically some overhead that keeps you from really being able to at a glance understand, you know, the status of all the vulnerabilities in your application. Um, you know, if, if you run a scanner on your container and it says zero, that's a heck of a lot better than running a container on your, you know, uh, you know a scanner on your container and it says, oh, 10 vulnerabilities, but I can explain away this one and this one and this one. And kind of having that overhead of having to think about all of those and, and check whether they're exploitable or not is itself a, a pretty big burden. And uh, I, in our opinion, uh, hurts your security posture. Yeah, because you're just going to have to continuously go back to those security reviews and give the same justification that these don't matter, these don't exist for the same reasons you keep giving. And that's just not, it's not fun for anyone. No, it's 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 not. Uh, but it is unfortunately a pretty pretty widespread problem, uh, and and so with that, I think I'm going to turn it over to John Speed, who will tell you a little bit about the details of of you know how container images are vulnerable and which ones are popular. Great, thank you, Zach. Um, James, if you could share the slides. Um, these next few parts, we're just going to have some slides, and it's mainly just to. Um, uh, have some visuals so that as I talk about numbers, you actually see the magnitude. Um, so uh, before I start um, showing these different numbers, the thing we, a couple things you should know. Um, uh, we wanted to know what are the most popular base images to actually have data. And one way to do that is to survey people and go and talk. Another way is to actually examine code artifacts. So we went the second option. And we use GitHub code search. It's a little like Google for code search. You can search across GitHub and look at millions of artifacts, in this case, Docker files, and look at uh, what base images are getting used and how often. So we actually did that. And we said, please go look at the part of the Docker file, the from line that imports a base image, and let's find the most popular base images. So if you go to the next slide, um, there is a uh, bar graph here that shows you in relative terms the most popular base images in this. It's a set of roughly 3 million Docker files. And you'll see um, ones that you probably know well, um, Alpine, and Ubuntu, Debian. Um, you also will see some programming language specific ones, OpenJDK for Java, uh, Node for uh, Node slash uh, JavaScript, TypeScript. Um, so uh, what we did is then we took a subset of these and said, well, what is their security debt? How many vulnerabilities are there before you even start adding in additional packages in your own programming logic? So if you go to the next slide, please. So that starting line, we want to see what that starting line looks like. Exactly. This is the starting line. This is before you do anything. So um, of course, when you actually do this analysis with your real live application, it will be different because you're adding in additional code, additional components. So um, I'm going to show three. There are really three things to take away from this top line image. And what we've what we've done here, just to know, is we've used a number of popular, widely used scanners. The details aren't that important, and that's that's a key point here. We're not trying to pick on any one scanner or say our results reflect one scanner. In fact, we use three, and they have broadly similar results. And um, we looked at five different base images. At the very top, you'll see that this node base image, uh, node colon 17, um, no matter the scanner, there were hundreds of reported vulnerabilities. Again, like Zach said, that doesn't mean that these all affect your application. But it means that these, if you're a diligent security team that is security conscious, uh, you have some sort of sensitive data or sensitive computing resources, um, you potentially have to wade through hundreds of reported vulnerabilities to make a, uh, a decision about what to remediate and what to patch. So that's a lot of security debt. It's a bummer. 861 things to sift through is really difficult for anyone. It's a nightmare. You don't want to do this. I've found myself in that uh, position before with a base image. At the time, I didn't even understand it. Um, I, I admit to throwing up my hands and pretending to ignore it all. 
Um, so I am sorry to the software world and uh, uh, I'm sure others have done it and it's okay, um, but I think we can do better. Um, and then there's three in the middle that I wanna point out and they're all similar here. These are Debian, Red Hat, their universal base image or UBI and Ubuntu. And you'll see that depending upon the scanner and the image, there's roughly 25 to 100 reported vulnerabilities. So many fewer, but still a number that you have to go through and not fun to track it in a spreadsheet. And then there's a third one here. There's a, a third category. And Alpine is not the only one like this, but there's the only one in our analysis like this where no matter the scanner, there were zero reported vulnerabilities on that day it was scanned for for that version. Uh, as, uh, as a maintainer, I was going to ask and point that out because this is the day you did that scan. That's right. And as we all know, things change. Things change. There's been new there's been new minor patch releases to Alpine to help fix some vulnerabilities that were found. So this is just a snapshot in time, right? That's right. Just a snapshot. When we did this analysis a couple months ago before we published the white paper, you know, the white paper doesn't update magically. Uh, <laughs> it's a dead PDF. Um, and um, so what that suggests to us, though, is it is possible to create a container and, um, and a popular one that has uh, few or zero reported vulnerabilities. And uh, uh, of course, um, we'll get into this more later with Ariadne, but uh, Alpine is a relatively security oriented um, base image. Um, and uh, so that helps explain it. And so one more slide, and then I'll pass it back. We wanted to check, are these vulnerabilities newly reported? Did they just come out yesterday? And that's what explains what's going on. So we looked at uh, the base images that had reported vulnerabilities and looked at in what year their vulnerabilities were reported. Um, and you can see that for Node, some of the vulnerabilities, that, I'm sorry, it's probably small on your screen, but they stretch back 20 years. Um, and so uh, there's almost a couple dozen vulnerabilities from two decades ago. And, but you'll see the other ones, especially with Ubuntu and with Red Hat, a lot of the vulnerabilities um, first originated a few years ago, um, past five years, but interestingly, Debian's more spread. So what do I take away from these graphs? Unfortunately, security debt can stick around, um, which is unfortunate. So um, I'll pass it back to James and Zach at this point. Um, and that's the that's the, really the slides part. So no more PowerPoint slides. Sorry, everyone. Hey, sometimes a uh, you know picture speaks a thousand words and sometimes uh, 861 vulnerabilities. So with that, Zach, do you want to talk to us a little bit about some of the implications that this analysis gave us? Yeah, sure. So, so as we were alluding to before, right? You know, if you start and your your security team has to wade through 861 vulnerabilities, um, you know, that's that's a lot of work, you know. And so, even if they do that, you know, totally correctly, you know, they they assess the the impact of each one. That only holds often today, right? You could very easily add a dependency on something that's already in your base image uh, that happens to have some vulnerability in it. Uh, and, and now that analysis that your security team did that says this CVE isn't something we care about, that's totally out the window. Um, and, and similarly, you know, uh, even, even if they do it correctly, it's, it's, only, it's only valid for today. And then also, you know, also the, that's a lot of work, right? That's, that's just a lot of time that you know, uh, engineers have to spend sort of, again, wading through, sifting through, you know, one by one going through, understanding these vulnerabilities, understanding how they're exploited and understanding whether your application should care. You know? um, and that's, that's a lot of time that could be better spent doing almost anything else. You know, you, you typ typically- <laughs> Adding we're, business value. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're, we're, we're in software to you know, build things and, and, and not to like categorize, you know, you know is, is my app affected by this, this uh, vulnerability or not? Um, and so you know, one, one, one takeaway you might have from this is that there's a huge advantage to selecting you know, what, what we've been calling a quiet base image. You know, an, an image that starts with few or zero vulnerabilities. There's always a possibility that you can introduce ones later on, right? As you add the, the dependencies of your application, you might be pulling in things with vulnerabilities. As you add your application itself, that may may have vulnerabilities. So you're never you're never certain that 
um, you know, your, your image, your, your final container image with your application in it, it doesn't have any vulnerabilities listed in the CVE database. That's where a scanner like, you know, SNCC or, or Trivi or, or Gripe come in. Um, but it's much, much easier to have that assurance uh, if you start from zero than if you start from, again, hundreds. Um, yeah, and I think, I think there's, a, there's a huge, uh, you know, number of benefits to doing this. Uh, you know, one is, is again, velocity, right? Just uh, freeing up your development and your security teams to work on things that matter a little bit more to your core business. Um, and the other is security. You know, uh, if, if there are zero vulnerabilities, they, they can't be exploited. Uh, and, so, and so, you know, we'll, we'll get a little bit later on into, you know, how, you, you know, how one can achieve sort of these, these quiet base images. You know, picking one off the shelf is, is great. Uh, there, there are sort of other options you can, you can sort of start from, um, you know, you, uh, you want your base image to be updated often and, and to be responsive to CVEs. Uh, you also want your base image not to include a lot of irrelevant stuff that, you know, the, that has the potential to introduce a dependency, but that you don't need. Because, you know, if you can just trim that out, uh, then you don't have to worry about it. That's a very good point. I one of the things I, I continuously want to point out to folks, and as we've had this discussion, is that this is a point in time that was secure. And you know, security is always about a mindset, not a state. So asking the question like, "Are we secure?" Those questions are kind of, you know, moot point because yes, at this current point in time, we may be secure. But like I talked about. 3.15.1 came out, there are some vulnerabilities. We always have to be treating our containers like software. So reducing the time that they're basically alive should be much lower because then if a patch comes out, patch the container, pass the, ba pass the ba base image, and we move that, you know, that starting line back to zero. So keeping that in mind. Yeah, that's, um, a, that's a great point, James. Uh, if, if you are, you know, every day is, is a, a new adventure, you know, new vulnerabilities come out. Uh, and so you really do want your security team to be, to be continually checking uh, that you don't have any vulnerabilities. Uh, and it's a lot easier to, to run a scanner, see the number zero and think, yep, we have, we have no vulnerabilities in this container versus, you know, to, to run the, the scanner, see a number, you know, a big number and oh we got to subtract out the base images ones we can kind of account for all of those you know you know that that's just fuzzy math and and um mo again much zero is a much better number here than anything greater than zero exactly exactly um all right so with that we've been talking a lot about images in general and how you can secure containers from a general perspective. I want to go ahead and shift a little bit more and talk a little bit about um, how Alpine deals with this from a security perspective. So Ariadne, can you talk us through a little bit how you were able to get 315.0 to zero vulnerabilities? Um, sure. The, the main trick, honestly, behind having a quiet base image is to have less things in it. And so we've kind of seen that with distrolists and all of that uh, to slim down images uh, in order to reduce the vulnerability count. And so in Alpine, we kind of take this to a um, to the next level, basically, in terms of like uh, the Alpine base system only depends on nine things uh and at least uh counting them at least four of them are purely data oriented packages so there's only two main three main moving parts in the alpine busy or in the alpine ecosystem there's apk tools busy box open rc that's it the only other things that get installed are things that are intended to support the, uh, the use of those applications like Musil. Um, so this is why like... I have to install curl every single time I use Alpine. Exactly. Okay. Uh, there's no curl on the, on the machine. So you can't curl bash and exploit or whatever <laughs> you want to do. Um, and so kind of this less is more um, philosophy 
uh, as elaborated in the white paper is how we were able to do this in Alpine. You know, when you only have three major applications that are in your base system, uh, if there's a CVE in one of them or one of the dependencies, then it's really easy to just cut a new release and be done with it. And, you know, that's what we do. When a CVE drops, we just release a new version of Alpine and then we're back at zero vulnerabilities for the base image. And, you know, we frequently get inquiries from people like on our bug tracker um, asking if the scanners are working because it's, you know, coming back zero vulnerabilities. And so we've actually had to record you know, CVEs that people can use to validate the scanners as so-called canary CVEs because of the fact that there's just so few moving parts in the base image that could possibly have a CVE. Um, and I mean, that's that's basically the trick to it is, you know, having less moving parts means that you have more uh, security advantages in terms of not having to deal with remediation. Um, and so that's that's the secret sauce, basically. Well, I want to thank you for that secret sauce. Uh, some of the folks may not know, I'm one of the Ingress Nginx maintainers, and we're based on the Alpine image. So we had this same issue that just came up and said, hey, someone opened up an issue, said, hey, you're vulnerable to this exploit. We bumped the revision up to 3.15.6, re-ran the scans, and had zero vulnerabilities. So thank you for all of your hard work on that, making my job very easy to make sure that we have zero exploits on that image. Well, most of the work is being done by the Alpine security team, and there's a lot of talented people that are involved in that. Um, and, uh, like, um, Kevin Doubt, uh, in the community known as Icky, is very involved in making sure that patches get applied quickly. And then there's a lot of contributors that are, you know, constantly bringing in new patches to packages in the Alpine system. So we have this really efficient workflow to ensure that patches get distributed quickly and that if we need to cut a new release and a new base image, we get it out the door as soon as possible. So. Well, with that, can you give some folks uh, maybe an idea of how they could set up a pipeline that could do something like that, things that they should be looking at to do to help them be able to get those vulnerabilities fixed as quickly as the Alpine security team does? Yeah. So um at ChainGuard, we've been working on a set of open source tooling, uh, namely APKO, that allows you to declaratively define the contents of a Docker image that uses an APK-based distribution, such as Alpine, but there are some other ones out there. Um, so and... I've used KO from a Go perspective. That's similar? Yeah, so basically APKO takes a list of packages and repositories and keys, and then it assembles an image based on that. And that allows you to um, automatically rebuild the images on a nightly basis, and then that way you're just constantly keeping them up to date. Um, now... If you're just using like Docker or something like that, that doesn't really do you much good. But if you are using Kubernetes, then you can use like Canary deployments or traffic uh, shifting or whatever you want to use in order to uh, migrate over to the new image in real time. I think the point stands that if you're doing containers, you should be doing nightly builds, be pulling in the new yes. vulnerability fixes. Yeah. And tools Absolutely. like APKO help out with that. Okay. Awesome. So I've got some qu other questions too about Alpine just in general. Um, so now we see that Alpine is very security focused, but uh, I, I, 
maybe we can talk about some of the FUD that's around um, Alpine and maybe the uh, why some folks don't see Alpine as an enterprise distro. If it's such security minded, why wouldn't enterprises want to adopt Alpine? Well, you, you know, uh, part of the problem, I think, with Alpine in the enterprise is, you know, that it's based on Musil and Musil has a lot of security advantages, but when that comes up against um, enterprise software, there's kind of this tug of war in, in that enterprise software doesn't really have fast development velocity and, um, you know, uh, by comparison, Musil doesn't support a lot of legacy standards that like glibc supports. So to target Musil, you have to be coding against the latest and greatest standards. And so, you know, the folks over at like SAP or whatever, you know, they might not be coding against um, the standards that Musil is developed, you know, developed to implement. So, you know, the challenge is to um, make sure that what you're developing against is like the latest version of POSIX or the latest version of, you know, SUS or whatever. And um, as long as you're doing that, it's fine. But a lot of enterprises, you know, they're still like developing against like C++ 98 or something like that, where they're expecting legacy behavior that might not necessarily be there with Musil. So. so again, it comes up to that developer velocity. So being able to make changes and push changes through the environments, it's just not as fast as uh, as we'd like them to be, right? Yeah. That, that's the main challenge. Um, and then in the past, there's been some problems with like DNS and uh, DNS situation's gotten a lot better over the years, and we're about to implement DS uh, DNS over TCP and Musil, and that should solve most of the remaining issues with DNS. But occasionally, you'll get like somebody who has like a crazy idea to distribute like a 300 megabyte uh, etcd database uh, using DNS, and then that fails with Musil and I mean, you know, Zach's kind of looking at me in horror describing this, but um, I mean, that is that is a case that somebody brought to us to like try to investigate. So, I mean, Musil's not as forgiving uh, as some of the more legacy systems where, you know, like you could say that glibc uh has a lot of these capabilities because they've seen a lot of crazy things that people do and musil just hasn't really gone through enough of that yet but um at the same time it's kind of an advantage in that you know musil being not a commercial project um there's kind of an emphasis on doing things the correct way. And so like use cases where like 300 megs of ETC data being distributed by DNS, you know, uh, the rich, rich, the uh, rich Felker, the maintainer of Musil might look at that person and think that they've lost their mind. And just, just because you can do it doesn't mean you should. Exactly. Do it. It's yeah. so, so, you know, generally speaking, as long as you're following like good software development practices and good operational practices, Musil will treat you very well. But if you're doing things that are more exotic, um, it's definitely going to be a problem. And we've run you're into have that. A bad time. Yeah, we've okay. run into that in enterprise settings, but. Um, there's a lot of people using Alpine and Enterprise and they're happy with it. So, I mean, the, the white paper kind of speaks for itself in that it regard. We've got so. a question here from William. Let's see. Uh, has anyone made a nice package to separate CA certs from glibc? And that has been the core of bloat for containers that he's ran into and vulnerabilities. So, um, all right, Niala, you take that one. 
Um, so I, I assume that he's talking about the CA certificates package in both Debian and Alpine, which it's based on the same package, basically. Um, in Alpine, we have actually introduced CA certificates bundle, which is just a pre-compiled version of the CA certificates package. And so if you use that, then you don't need to have OpenSSL on the system to create the bundle. And if you don't need OpenSSL, then you don't need glibc. So that's, you know, definitely a possibility to look into. Um, and uh, I noticed that he's running Arch, so <laughs> he could probably borrow the work that we did in Alpine to do the pre-compiled bundle and integrate it into Arch. Awesome. All right, that's great. Well, folks, if you have any questions, just make sure to drop those in the chat. Um, so Zach and John, from the vulnerabilities exploits and the issues that we've pointed out in the white papers, what are some things that you are seeing in the wild that folks could do to help reduce those issues that you've pointed out in the white paper? Yeah, at the, at the risk of, you know, beating the, the same drum too many times, I think being very deliberate about your choice of base image, uh, trying to be as minimal as possible, trying to strip back, uh, looking into using alternative tools rather than starting with, you know, uh, kind of a traditional Docker file with a from line, uh, using things like KO, uh, APKO, um, other, other sort of uh, built tools that assemble containers uh, with, with a minimal of, of bloat in there. Um, are all going to be your friend. And I'll just say another thing we've been playing around with. This hasn't been, um, we're not arguing that we've observed a lot of this, but is uh, the idea of having, um, when you have these minimal base images, uh, uh, it also becomes relatively tractable and possible using certain build tools to have software bill of materials associated with it. Um, which you can then feed into uh, separate data systems so you more easily track your components. Um, and so this is, a, you could call that a security feature that um, I think ideally, and we mentioned this in the white paper, can be attached to uh, base images and other components too um, to help you have a up-to-date um, component inventory. Yeah, I just noticed that uh, I think earlier this month, Docker did come out with support for SBOMs and a lot of other tools. I think um, Sneak just came, not Sneak, uh, there's another tooling that just came out with attestations for their SBOMs that help increase the security of those containers being deployed and scanned. Um, okay. Um, so some of the questions, so from a pipeline perspective, are there anything that... Uh, is there anything that we should be doing as container and software developers to increase the security of those besides the ones that we've just uh, talked about? I... Yeah, oh, I think I think you hit on it a little bit before, James, but uh, rebuilding is, is actually really important here. Uh, images, the world is not static when it comes to vulnerabilities, right? Uh, old libraries, uh, wind up with with vulnerabilities in them you know every day tomorrow uh you know if you if you do the that same scan that we did in the white paper today you do it again 24 hours later some of those numbers are going up uh and and so making sure you're really in a in a position to uh keep you know to make updates really really easy uh and to to understand when your container images are vulnerable and to be able to you know just you know bump a version number and push and have that have that process be really really smooth would help a lot, I think, from a pipeline perspective in, in terms of keeping uh, your, your images secure. And I think that uh, that goes into a little bit of what you were talking about earlier about developer velocity and not butting heads with security. Because if we're actively updating our containers, reducing our vulnerabilities, we have less security tickets that we have to put in, less manual reviews. And so that helps increase the, the security of our applications on our containers as well. Yeah, I, I think you'll find that that the folks at ChainGuard are, are many of them are developers first, and, and we're very interested in building these security features, but uh, no way are we going to put put something out that gets in the way of, of just writing code. We, we want security to be something that makes that easier. You know, it, it should be your security practices should go hand in hand with good development practices, high developer velocity. 
Exactly. Well, I think we've done a really good job of talking through the white paper and discussing some of the implications that have happened there. I think one of the questions I would like to ask, and this is just uh, you know the million dollar question, uh, if you had a magic wand and you could fix um, software security or software supply chains, what would you do to fix those? And that's to all three of you. Um, so one thing that I've seen that I would like to see more um, aggressive uh, adoption of is the use of S-bombs in the space because by using S-bombs in combination with like security vulnerability scanners, you can um, have more consistent results because one of the main problems that we see today with like the scanners is that one vulnerability scanner might see like um, one set of packages and vulnerabilities and another scanner might see a different set. And, you know, if, if we use the S bombs as the actual like source, source of, of truth, truth, um, then we can have consistent scan results across the entire, um, ecosystem. And that would be probably a, the most important thing that we could do right now. John, do you uh, have a... <laughs> I'm still meditating. It's a tough question. I defer to Zach if he's got a good one. Okay, sure, sure, sure. <laughs> so so I can I can give you a I guess a pet answer which is which is related to something I've been spending a lot of time on lately. Uh, package repositories themselves are one of the best things that have ever happened for developer velocity. It's so great, you know, to be able to apt install a package as opposed to, you know, find the find the web page, which could be on, you know, any one of a number of web services and you know, try to find the right tarball and download that and, and build it myself and link against that. Um, pa package repositories, I think, are truly tremendous for, for the ease of use of your operating system as a, as a user um, and also the ease of use of, of building packages. Uh, however, uh, with, with sort of great power comes great responsibility here. And these package repositories are a very, very central point. Uh, you know, if, if you got into, you know, NPM, if you got into the apt repositories. Uh, or just you, one of those, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, you could do a whole lot of damage because so many people are all coming to this one central place. It's not like, you know, the, the old times, right, when, when everyone was all over the place. Sure, there are many easy points to compromise, but the fallout of, of compromising any one of those sort of sources of your, of your uh, dependencies are really, you know... Uh, it's limited, right? It's it's only the developers of, of, you know, using that specific package from that specific location. With a repository, you know, sort of that's that's multiplied. Everyone's going through the same funnel. Um, and so I suppose uh, I am personally really, really excited about uh, bringing security features to the package repository and package manager ecosystems uh, that help a lot with provenance. Things like SBOMs, things like package signatures and and uh, using uh, technologies like the update framework to help ensure uh, that you're checking the right signatures. Um, and so I think uh, I think there's a lot of progress being made. Uh, uh, just today, the OpenSSF uh, uh, announced a working group for uh, software repositories that I think is going to do a, a bunch of great work in this in this direction. So that would help me if I was a, if I'm if I'm deploying something new that people need to depend on. I would want to start using what's coming out of that working group. I know the open SSF just put out uh, best practices from a security perspective, something similar in that vein. Uh, ideally, this is something that should be entirely transparent to you as an end user. Uh, and and it, the work is all gonna be uh, by the package repository maintainers. Uh, there are a bunch of um, really hardworking folks and they're all very interested in, in sort of uh, moving, moving. And by no means am, do I mean to, to you know, uh, uh, be too harsh on them. You know, they do a great job with security already. Uh, but just, just you know, we want the these things are so critical. The standard for uh, level of security has to be so high. Uh, and, so and this so, is this is helping to level set everyone to make sure that other, we're all on the same secure playing field. Yeah, we're, some we're, some do it better than others, just like everyone else. Mm -hmm. 
Yep, yep. Uh, and so, and so the goal the goal of this working group is to sort of help uh, uh, package managers in various language ecosystems and various OS ecosystems uh, to learn from each other to help establish best practices. Uh, we're not making any kind of you know binding recommendations in this group. You know, it's not a standards body, uh, but ju to just kind of help every exactly help everyone lift each other up. Okay. All right. Well, that's really helpful, John. I'm not going to let you off the hook too easily. No, I've been I've been brainstorming Zach uh, uh, an area, and you gave me time. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm not going to say that this proposal is in superior to the other ones. It's simply a compliment, which is, um, and uh, I've been um, I've heard this idea and ex ex explored it some with a professor from Purdue, Santiago Torresarias, who I know many of you might know. And um, the idea is of a software supply chain security observatory. And it's really a way to gather systematic data across um, package managers, uh, across source code management systems, and to uh, gather, analyze, curate, and search for indications of uh, malicious or suspicious behavior um, and malicious or suspicious code. And there's already a, many precedents for this, but I think the part that's missing is the um, having it not be specific to one ecosystem, but to apply generally and broadly. Um, how, how is that different than the CVE database? Ah, so the CVE database right now tracks reported vulnerabilities. So someone has to have gone through the process. There are truly hoops that you go to, and uh, uh, then you push that out, and um, there you go. Unfortunately, um, and I don't have exact numbers on this, and I'll explain why. It's hard, to, uh, a surprising number of, for instance, malicious compromises detected in open source software never make it into the CVEs. Um, and, um, and what happens is uh, something will get reported uh, if it gets detected, um, and then it simply is removed or squashed or yanked, and that's the end of the story. Uh, and... Uh, so, of course, in some ways, that's good. Hopefully, this thing got detected and won't affect new users anymore. But um, if it never makes it into the CVE database, it's hard to track, build future defenses, um, and make uh, reasonable software supply chain security decisions. So this is the, the big idea, and there's a million little permutations of it. Gotcha. OK. Uh, we've got another question here from William. What is better for a CICD, generally speaking, the base image and add a layer on top of the image or a root tarball from a distro and build all the dependencies in one layer? Um, both are terrible. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, the, the best way to do this is to build a... build the... Uh, environment on demand that you need in order to build a component in and we're actually we have an experimental tool that we've been developing called melange um that allows you to do that it basically wraps apko and combines it with a build pipeline and so you can basically get the best of both worlds there you get the custom base image generated on demand and then you can build on top of that to um build the software components that you need and then you combine those software components into a final image and ultimately like in a secure software factory that's the way that you're supposed to do it um unfortunately where we are right now in the industry we're not quite there yet, but uh, that's one of the things that we're going to try to teach people how to do this like the right way with the proper software engineering practices. And when you do it that way, you get all of the provenance and S-bombs for free. Um, and the tool, so the tools are generating that all for you. Exactly. And so that's like really the ideal way to do the CICD type pipeline is to, you know, do it fully declaratively instead of messing around with layers and tarballs and so on. Okay. Well, with that, do we have any final words from the audience or from our speakers? 
So the way I understand it is use Alpine because it is a secure base. If it's not needed for legacy builds, make sure that you're using tooling that injects provenance, S-bombs, and all of the other things that we've talked about into your build pipeline so that folks know that what you're building is exactly what you've said it is and that it is vulnerable, vulnerability free. Good, su good summation <laughs> for the last 40 minutes of discussion. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks, James, for hosting. Well, thank you, Zach and John, for the white paper. And Ariadne, thank you for all of what you're doing with APKO and the other tools that you're building. This has been Chain Guard Live. Thanks, everyone. Yep. Bye. Bye.